Hello there and welcome to episode 20 of The Creative Entrepreneur. This is going to be another stellar one, a great guest. I just know you're going to love this interview with Derek Sivers. He is definitely a creative entrepreneur. The guy has done so many things. For one, he founded CD Baby in 1998. CD Baby became the world's largest online seller of independent music. So if you know much about my history, you know uh, it's, it's something that's close to my heart. In more recent years, Derek has become widely known for some of his TED Talks, one in particular called How to Start a Movement, uh, which featured uh, this dancing guy thing. If you haven't seen it, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. And it's had close to three and a half million views on the TED site alone. Derek also is the author of Anything You Want. And most recently, he started a company that's called Wood Egg, which is basically their books on moving to and starting a business in 16 different countries in Asia. So a guy with a pretty wide and varied background. And in this interview, uh, you find a lot of the advice that he dishes out or his sort of philosophy uh, on business and life is not the typical thing. Some of them actually surprise me, even though I've known Derek for a long time. So I know you're going to really be intrigued by this great interview. This episode is brought to you by the DIY Career Manifesto, which just happens to be a book that I published last year. I call it the unconventional guide to turning your talents and know-how into a profitable business. And in this book, for the first time, I chronicle a lot of my personal journey over the years to self-employment and a lot of the lessons that I learned, which I found to be outside of the norm of what most people were recommending at the time. Right now, it's only available for sale as a Kindle uh, ebook uh, on Amazon. It's only $2.99, and so I'll have a link to that and other things that I discuss in this episode in the show notes on the website. But you can get kind of a big, fat-free sample of it by going to DIYCareerManifesto.com. There's a number of links on that page and that site where uh, you can sign up, and uh, I'll send you a, a download link uh, to a free copy big sample of it and it just so happens to put you on an email list where I will send you an update every time a new creative entrepreneur interview is posted so all sorts of goodness if you just visit DIYCareerManifesto.com all right thanks again for listening here's that interview with Derek Sivers Hey, it's Bob Baker. Welcome to the uh, Creative Entrepreneur interview series. And this is going to be a real fun one because I am uh, just really thrilled today to be talking to an old friend of mine, Derek Sivers. How are you, Derek? Good. Yeah, great to finally be talking with you again. Yeah, I know. Well, we our paths have crossed many times. In fact, dude, we got to go way back. Uh, uh, in fact, um, I remember I was actually about a year and a half ago. I was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm coming here from my home office in St. Louis, and I was sorting through some old boxes like a year and a half ago, and I actually came across these like uh, uh, order form, like people that had ordered my books that I'd hung on to, and and you, and I came across actually you had ordered like the, one of the original version of the Gorilla Music Marketing Handbook for yep. me. And I'm thinking it was either 96 or 97, probably 96-ish. Yep. And, that's, and, and at some point after that, we actually had a couple of phone calls. I mean, back in, back in, yeah. back in the 90s when you were a uh, musician. Uh, yeah, and, so, and I sent you my demo, and I think I bought a little ad space in your... Uh... Yeah, I, <laughs> I had this. Yeah, I had this publication that was sent out to like record labels and and radio stations yeah. and all this stuff that I was. I put out like three issues of it, and uh, and yeah, you <laughs> ran an ad in there. In fact, I remember you were you asked me about a you had a we're, we're, we're debating between two or three different headlines, and one of them was wasn't it the Beatles meets James Brown or something? Yeah, you still remember? Yeah, that was how I ended up describing my music for many years after that. Yeah, and I said that's that's <laughs> that's that's the that's the winner. Um, but dude, that's like coming up on. Uh, in a couple of years, that's going to be like twenty years ago. That's just, I know that's that's, that's scary. Um, yeah. So so let me just give you people the uh, people a broad overview. A lot of people know who you who you are, and actually these days for different reasons. But um, I also remember a conversation I had with you around ninety seven ish, where you said I got this idea to create this little CD store, or, or you know, to, to, for my musician friends to you know, do you think this would be a viable thing to be an interest in this? Yeah. And I went, dude, it sounds good. <laughs> So anyway, you founded CD Baby in in uh, 1998, correct? Mm-hmm. 
and uh, and ran it for ten years. Uh, mm-hmm. Eventually sold it. Um, I know you're also uh, you, in an email exchange that we had. You're also sort of well known for this TED talk that you did about dancing guy. And so, but for for people like like these days, now that you've been, you know, you've done so many things, if for people to say, so Derek, who are you? What do you do? How would you answer that question? No. How would I answer that? Um, well, it's funny. I think I'm accidentally becoming one of those people that uh, has a, a broad background, you know, like, well, I was a farmer for 20 years, then a commercial airline pilot, then I was a stockbroker. So, yeah, I I was a really a full-time musician. And you know what we skip over is that during my musician years, one of the ways I made a living for 10 years, I was the ringleader MC of a circus up in New Zealand, I mean, sorry, uh, New England. Yeah. And um, so it was a circus entertainer for 10 years doing children's music. I ran a recording studio, ran a booking agency. Then I started CD Baby and that of all things took off and that got huge. But then after doing that for 10 years, I, um, I felt like it got too big. It was bigger than I ever wanted it to be. I really like things to be small and it kind of got out of control. So I sold the company. And then spent the last few years bopping around the world trying to reinstall my operating system, if you know what I mean, trying to just change the way I do things. And uh, then I started this book publishing company because I wanted to understand Asia better. And they say the best way to learn something is to teach it. So I started publishing books about 16 countries every year to uh, try to understand the cultures of the world better. And yeah, here we are. And that's kind of like your newest company. I think it recently officially launched. Is it called Wood Egg? Is that right? Mm-hmm. So Wood Egg. WoodEgg.com. Uh, <laughs> there you go. You have a, a, a physical representation. <laughs> On of, my desk. Right yep. there. Uh, <laughs> and so you, and yeah, that's one thing that you've done a lot. Like I know you've, uh, you actually live in, Singapore, I think you're actually visiting New Zealand now, and, and that's where you're Skyping from. So you've got yeah. this international uh, kind of flair about you. And what, what do you think? And I don't know, we're, you know, I'm going to get into the official list of questions here, but I'm curious because you spent most of your, I guess, those CD baby days living in the U.S., right? I mean, you were born and right. Yeah. You were actually born not far from me, like in somewhere in Illinois, right? Originally. Yeah. And I, I, I'm a total Chicago boy. Um, I did, even honestly, man, I, didn't have any interest in anywhere else in the world, even just like seven years ago. I was living in LA at the time. And I remember my girlfriend wanted to travel and I was just like, why would we go in anywhere else? We live in LA. This is like end of the rainbow. This is the best place in the world. Right. What are we going to do? Go to a different beach, you know? And, but there was somewhere around that time, I think it was when I was selling CD Baby that I think all of us have time in our life where you need to make a major change, right? Like whether it's a divorce or a graduation or, you know, problem with the alcohol or whatever, like there's, we all hit these different times in our life where it's like, I need to make a major change. Now I can't just keep doing things the same way I've been doing them. So when I sold CD Baby, it was kind of like that to me. It's like, I could just go keep doing this some more, but I feel like I need to make a big change. So yeah, for the next few years, it was just like everything I'm used to doing, I'm going to stop doing. And everything I used to hate doing, I'm going to start doing. And I'm just going to say yes where I used to say no and no where I used to say yes and just see what happens. And yeah, it just sent me all over the world and sent me you know, off to Iceland and India and then moving to Singapore and getting married and all this crazy stuff. So yeah, it's been a crazy five years kind of intentionally because I, like I said, I kind of wanted to... Yeah. Change my operating system. Yeah, I and mean, I think there's like videos of you like riding through Vietnam or something on either <laughs> a bike or a motorcycle, and you were in yeah. Amsterdam, I think, for a while too. Where, where yeah, this is that's so that's that's crazy. I mean, yeah, but a lot of people sort of maybe dream about that, but you actually sort mm-hmm. of did it. Yeah, and I guess so. What is the value of getting outside of your comfort zone? Like, I mean, has it now that now that you've done those things, you say, oh boy, I'm glad that I did, and what a, a rich life I've led as a result. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of have this motto that life is all about memories, mm-hmm. right? Like if you got to the end of your imagine that you were you were the healthiest person and you brush your teeth and you exercise and you eat all your vegetables and you live to be a hundred. But if you didn't if you couldn't remember any of it, did it's like did you really live? You know what I mean? So to me the the making big changes in your life are kind of like little 
hooks to hang your memories on. Right. right. You remember that time you went here. You remember that time you did that crazy thing. You remember that time that you, whatever, dressed up as a clown or whatever. <laughs> if, if you just keep yeah. doing the same thing all the time and you go into the same job for years on end and nothing changes, those are those years that you really can't remember very well, you know, because it's like, well, one day is the same as the next. So it was kind of this intentional idea of scrambling that up and making a bunch of unique memories to right. hang my hooks on or hook my memories on to. Um, and I'm glad I did it. On the other hand, it's it can be a little overrated. <laughs> <laughs> Overwhelming maybe too, or perhaps. Or... Um, yeah, I think it's, no, I'd say overrated that, um, you know, you still bring yourself with you wherever you go. And uh, every place is not so different than the rest. I mean, you still just kind of wake up in a bed and do your thing, whatever it may be. And so, um, yeah, but I, I advise anybody, if you're thinking about making a big change in your life, you should pretty much always do it. That's cool. That's cool. I love that. Um, and uh, and let me just ask you real quickly before we uh, just as for the for the background. Tell me the uh, the uh, the origin of the dancing guy Ted video because I because I think that that's something that you become known for in recent years almost as much as if not maybe even more than in some eyes as as your your years with with CD Baby. But what yeah. uh, what uh, yeah what was the inspiration for that? Just a quick story of how that came about and and what its attention has brought you as a result. It was just one of those little videos that was bouncing around YouTube that somebody said, oh, check this out. Guys dancing at a concert and then a bunch of people join in. And the first time I watched it and I thought, oh, that's funny. And then the second time or more like after I watched it the first time, I thought that's actually a really good metaphor for all this stuff I've been learning about leadership and how to make a movement. And uh, the book of the tipping point by Malcolm Gladwell or these books on leadership by Seth Godin, I thought, that little three minute video was actually an awesome metaphor for what I've been learning. So then I watched it again and I thought, yeah, like, look how it's like one person kind of starts it, but that isn't a movement, you know, it isn't until these other people join in. So, um, yeah, if you haven't seen it yet, check it out. But then at the Ted conference, um, the famous Ted conference, they asked me to give that little talk on stage and I was terrified. And I, I mean, I said, yes, but, like literally minutes before I was set to go on, I was backstage and I couldn't remember any of the lines. And it's not like a PowerPoint thing where I have like, you know, slides to cue me. It's just a video of a guy dancing and I have to spout all this, you know, insight over the top of it. Right. And I couldn't remember any of my lines. I was terrified. And I went out there and they said, ladies and gentlemen, Derek Sivers. And you talk about an intimidating audience. You go out there and like, there's Bill Gates, there's Al Gore, there's like all these like oh my God. world leaders and movers and shakers. There's the there's the guy that invented Unix. There's the you know <laughs> the Larry Page CEO of Google. And the, these are the people in the audience. And they started it up, and I did it, and I nailed it, and they gave me a standing ovation. And I went outside and had a heart attack <laughs> and <laughs> threw up or something. But one of the hi- yeah. yeah, exactly. But like one of the highlights of my life is. About an hour after that, I'm outside and Peter Gabriel is standing with a couple people like having a conversation. And then he sees me and he, he says to his friends, oh, excuse me for a minute. And then he comes up to me really excited and like shakes my hand. He's like, brilliant talk. Really, just one of the most <laughs> profound and funny things. I've Really, this is my favorite talk of the whole conference. Thank you. That was wonderful. It's like, thank wow. you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I assume you were a fan of his. Yeah, an iconic yeah. music figure. God, that was, yeah, that was like one of the highlights of my life. Yeah, well, anyway. that, but that's awesome. It has millions of views, and I'm sure you've gotten a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, notoriety or feedback as a result of that. Yeah, it's my hit single. <laughs> it's your, your your viral video. All right, awesome. All right, Derek, we could spend a lot more time talking about your uh, your background because you have such an illustrious, uh, rich life to talk about. But let's go ahead and the official list of questions. I'm sure we'll touch on some other key elements there. Um, but I always like to ask people, like, if you had to look back on your success, whether it was with CD Baby or the things that you've done since then, and you had to identify maybe three key things that uh, were responsible for your current you know, situation, uh, what would those be? Okay, number one. I think has to be being in a big city. Um, When I look back, it's surprising how many of the great opportunities I had were just because I was in 
the big city where everything was happening. Whether it was, I lived in New York City for 10 years and LA for six years. And in both of those, some huge opportunities came up just because I was there. So that's number one. So, um, but what that really means is go be in a big city, but find a way to keep your costs down, you know, share a room, whatever. Um, don't splurge on anything. Just uh, don't go out to restaurants. But while you're there, meet everyone and go to everything. Like keep in touch with everyone you meet. It's it's about like the people you meet are the ones that are going to lift you up to success. You know, sometimes we think that success is all of our own doing, but usually the way it happens is that metaphorically speaking, somebody lifts you up. Do you know what I mean? Like somebody pulls you up to the next level in your career. Um, so go to everything, keep in touch with everyone. But number one, be in the big city. Cool. Um, number two, I'd say learn to do lots of things. Um, but that means like, let's say musically, that means playing not just guitar, but say guitar and bass and some keyboards and able to do some percussion and able to write well and play electric and acoustic and different styles. And actually, that also means having a, a little home studio, even if it's just this big and knowing the very basics of recording and engineering and producing. And um, the more you know how to do, the more you can say yes to every opportunity that may come your way. So I think so many things happened for me that uh, I was just in the middle of the big city, in the middle of everything. And um, number three, then, <laughs> is I would just say yes to everything. Like I would just pursue every opportunity. You go through all the little Craigslist kind of classifieds and everybody looking for something. You contact all of them and you say, yes, I'll do it. And I'll audition. You take every gig. You say yes to everything. One time somebody asked, um, hey, we're looking for a jazz piano player for this uh art opening. Do you know of a jazz piano player? I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm a jazz piano player. I'm like, oh, great. You know, and I was like, well, what does it pay? They said 300 bucks. I'm like, yeah, I'm a jazz piano player. And I got the gig and I was like, okay, I got to learn how to play jazz piano. <laughs> I quickly went and practiced. I was going to say, know, were you? Yeah. That... <laughs> right. So I think that's the kind of hustler mentality, right? You got to um, say yes to everything, pursue every opportunity and actively go and find every opportunity. Don't just kind of sit at home thinking, here's my path. I'm just going to get a record deal and be a rock star. You have to do everything around it and meet everybody. And um, yeah, for me, those are the three things looking back, I think were the that's, cause of my success. That's cool. That first one is I've never heard anyone, uh, I mean, there's, you know, now that I've done 20 of these interviews, I've noticed some patterns in people. And so there's some that kind of come up and, and I'm glad that they do because they're important ones. But the big city one, I've never heard any anyone, anyone say. So let me just ask you this, because you hear a lot of of ta or for a lot of advice and I've probably even given it myself where I'll where I'll say you know with the internet you don't have to live in New York to do this or or that you can reach people you know and I guess in particular fans you can reach mm -hmm. uh, you know throughout the world from no matter where you are as long as you have a good internet connection but what I'm hearing you say though is the uh, there's nothing can beat I guess the face to face interaction with people or how do you what do you how do you balance those two things about using the it's, internet to connect versus being having to be there or live there, I guess you, I should say. Yeah, I think it's not just the face-to-face -face contact. It's, it's real friendships, mm -hmm. you know, like not just transactional. It's like my, my real friends, the people that sleep over at my house and, you know, you hang talk into the night or whatever yeah. are people who – are record label owners or Broadway musical writers or famous uh, authors or whatever, just because I was living in the big city, you know, um, these are my neighbors. These are the people I, I put something on my website about Jack Holzman um, spelled J A C Holzman, H O L C M A N. He's the founder of Electra records. He's in his late seventies. Now he founded Electra records in 1949 and we're good friends now because somebody mutually introduced us, but mostly because he lived a mile down the road from me in LA. Oh, and wow. so we just take hikes together. He'd be like, Hey, I'm going to walk up the Canyon. You want to come? I'm like, sure. And Jack and I would walk off into the Canyon for hours because I lived a mile down the road, you know, and there's really something to that. Um, I mean, now, now that I'm living in places like Singapore and New Zealand, I meet people 
that are just as success. I mean, just as uh, bright, just as talented and all that, but because they're not like in the major right. media centers where the things are happening, they're not as successful. And they go like, wow, you're friends with whatever, Tim Ferriss, you're friends with these, but like, how did you do that? And I'm like, oh, I lived there. Like that's, yeah, I, I really think it's, it's kind of underrated now in this raw, raw internet uh, right. era. That's a well, that's a great a great uh, a great point. So maybe a lot of people are going to be making their plans to move now <laughs> after <laughs> after watching this, uh, and then uh, yeah, learn lots of things. So that, that's another thing that's that people debate about the being a jack of all trades versus having a specialty or a niche. You know that you you're the, you're the best saxophone player, but you're saying actually. Uh, have a wide array of talents. And, and I guess also, and, and this also ties into the thing um, about saying yes to everything. Does it matter like where you are in your career? Like I, my, my advice has always been if you're early in your career, say yes to everything, do everything. But as you go along, you get more established, then you, you're more picky about it. Is that how, what, what exactly? Your thoughts that? Yeah. yeah. You couldn't have said it better myself. That's exactly it. And since you were talking about, what was responsible for my growth, then yeah, it was saying yes to everything. But yeah, there's definitely a time where you have to change your approach, but you'll know when you hit that point, when you're totally overwhelmed, everybody wants you, everybody's inviting you to do everything and you've, you're multiple bookings on a single day. That's when you have to start saying no to some things, but until then say yes to everything. Right. Expand your experience and your, and all that good yeah. stuff. Awesome. Um, well, if, let's go ahead and continue into the uh, yeah the next question I like to ask, and that's you know in addition to success, every entrepreneur and creative person they have to deal with hurdles and challenges, and I'm sure in your uh, in your years you've experienced a uh, some as as well. So if you had to identify at least one, um, what would that be, and what did you learn from it, Derek? You know. I'm glad you sent over the, the questions in advance. So I had a few minutes to think about them, but this one totally stumped me. I, I sat here for a long time going, well, what was a major challenge I had? What was a business or creative challenge? Like, hmm, what was a big hurdle? And then I remember that actually somebody asked me this at a conference once too. It was like a Q and a session and I was like taking questions from the audience and, and, I really enjoy that. And just no matter what you ask me, I'll tell you the, the honest, raw, unfiltered truth. And then somebody asked me that question too, like, what's the biggest challenge? What was your biggest hurdle? And I remember it stunned me at the time too. And the, the guy came up to me afterwards, like when the event was done, he came up to me like literally out on the sidewalk and said, you know, I think the reason he said, I think it's the most interesting answer is that you couldn't think of a challenge. He said, I'll bet that you've got a kind of mindset where you don't really see anything as a challenge. And he was right that I think way, way early on, like when I was 19 or something, I read this Tony Robbins book that, that kind of taught me that anytime something bad happens, mm -hmm. just immediately, like you can find a way to turn it into something good. So there's this really common question. So whenever anything bad happens, you ask yourself, well, what's great about this? And of course, your first instinct is to go, nothing's great about this. This sucks. <laughs> but if you think about it some more, you go, well, okay, actually, you know, what's great about this is, you know, luckily I burned that bridge. So now I can go this way or whatever it may be. So I think that even in hindsight, it's like I've, my mind doesn't even remember any of these challenges as challenges because I always found a way to immediately spin them into something good so yeah i i sat here for a long time thinking and couldn't think of a single one so wow and, and that was that was, a, that was actually before you uh revealed what this guy t t said to you after the uh that conference i was thinking the same thing I went, so why <laughs> is that either you haven't had any challenges or you just process it differently uh and that seems to be it um yeah i was a tony robbins fan too and i still am but he <laughs> i think he, he said uh no matter what you always get a result yeah. So it's that, you know, and I, it, again, this is sort of like, you know, positive thinking, you know, just uh, um, euphemisms or, or whatever, but instead of referring to it as a failure, say, well, I got a result. It may not have been a result yeah. I wanted, but yeah. it's something you can learn from. I guess, is that kind of the philosophy there? Absolutely. I mean, everything's just an experiment, you know, let's see what happens if this happens. And, right. and yeah, and you know, what's funny is actually now that I'm thinking on my blog somewhere, I wrote, 
I put this blog post that 2007 for me was like the year that everything went wrong. And like I got divorced and uh, almost kicked out of CD Baby and all this drama and stuff like that. And even that, I look back and I'm like, glad it happened because it led to everything else great that's happened in the next five years was because things got so shaken up then. So, yeah, I mean, I guess it's not like I've just had an easy life, but it's all it's all your perception, right? That right. it's all about your reaction to everything that things can happen to you. And, and our reaction to it is what makes it horrible or great. So, right. Did you think having that attitude is something that, that came naturally for you to do, or did you have to develop that? Cause I don't think, I think a lot of people just will naturally go to the negative or whatever. And yeah, but, but, but I, to me, it's something I had to work on. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> you, I, you know, do you, I you too? read a lot of good books. Uh, I read a lot of good books uh, back starting when I was about 19. I would just, I, I so desperately wanted to be successful. I wanted to be a famous musician. I, and I knew that that was like wanting to be an Olympic gymnast, you know, like a million people want this thing and only one out of a million is going to get it. I want to get it. And so I would just read every book I could about success and successful mindsets and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. And I really, um, it, it changed my life. It's everything else in life became easier because I had a good mindset, you know? Awesome, awesome. I, I totally concur. <laughs> so, Derek, this has been great so far. Let's just uh, continue through the list of questions here to tap into your wisdom. This is what I always like to ask, too, is like, if you could go back and have a conversation with your younger self, and you can pick the age, you know, maybe the circus era or the, or the musician era or whatever, and give yourself three pieces of advice, um, what would they be? And here they are. What would you do exactly the same? You know, looking back in hindsight now from your perspective now, what would you avoid completely? The things that maybe that didn't work. And then what would you have done earlier? Cause you didn't have the wisdom at the time to know this was something that you should have, you know, should have done. So we'll start with the first one. What would you do? You know, exactly this, the same. Um, I feel that actually, if you don't mind, I'm going to kind of put all of those into one answer. There That's seems fine. to be a common theme when I think about like what I what I'm glad I did was the the DIY approach, the learning to do everything myself instead of just delegating it all away. And I meet a lot of helpless musicians that have somebody else who takes care of this and takes care of that. And they're left not knowing how to do anything themselves. Right. Yeah. So I'm glad that I learned to do everything myself. Uh, it gives a, a big sense of security and empowerment and, and even it's, fun and interesting but on the flip side of that then is if i had to do it all over again i wouldn't have done everything myself i think i should have had somebody focusing more on the inside of the industry right like the music industry um because i'd, I'd see later watching careers uh, by being at cd baby i'd see musicians careers how much they benefited if even if they were just a young 21 year old kid that got ripped off earlier in their career, just the fact that they did something on the inside of the music industry and they had even one album on A&M records or whatever, um, got them certain kind of connections and clout um, and open certain doors that then they could capitalize on for the rest of their life. Uh, instead of just saying, hey, we're indie only, man, I'm indie, right. I'm DIY, I do everything myself. It's like one semi-hit song can do more for your career than 20 years of gigging at clubs, you know? Right. So it's worth a lot of effort to try to work the inside of the music industry uh, to, to aim for just getting even one semi-hit song or one semi-deal or one song put into some movie somewhere, that's worth the effort. I think uh, yeah. trying to do everything yourself and being totally indie hurts more than helps. It's, and, that, it's, and that applies to it's, writers and authors, even yeah. visual artists. I mean, people of all, of all different careers too. And maybe it, it's, it's, yeah. it's okay to team up with a corporate entity <laughs> if there's some yeah. long-term benefit. You know? Yeah, especially if you're thinking of a career in the long-term arc. Like, yeah, I'm going to do this now when I'm young. At the beginning of my career, I'm going to go get a deal. And you know what? Who even cares about the money? Let them rip you off. Who cares? It doesn't matter because what you're doing is building this foundation of fame. 
mm-hmm. that you can build on for the rest of your career. So think of it long term. Don't worry about the rights to one single song that somebody might take or whatever. I mean, don't be completely stupid, but don't worry about it too much. I'd say like work the inside of the industry, especially earlier in your career. Cool, cool. Um, so does that take care of the three things? Uh, yeah. Advice to your younger self? Yeah, so, yeah, so, so embrace DIY, just don't overdo it, and don't be afraid to, to partner with a, a bigger company. Or to, and, and it kind of goes back to the big city thing, too, about, you know, move to the yeah. big city, meet people, you know, and, and uh, go ahead and if, they're, if they want to help you, then go ahead and use their influence to your advantage. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. Let's uh, let's see. or. I know uh, that you're, uh, you, you already mentioned that you're an avid uh, reader, read a lot of books in the early days, but if you had to just point out one book that changed your life, um, what would that be? I think it was How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. It's, it's got one of the worst, slimiest titles ever. The title's really a shame. Don't let the title of the book turn you off. I think it really should have been called How to Be Considerate because it really is the best book I've ever seen about how to think of things from the other person's point of view. That's what the whole book is about. And it's written way back in the 1930s. It's a, it's a classic. Um, and I think that that's really the, um, it's the underlying theme be, behind all of the best marketing yeah. is it's thinking of things from the other person's point of view. It's thinking how to be considerate. It's, it's you know, somebody wants to, find some new music. What are they thinking when they're looking for new music? Are they thinking about your introspective lyrics or your great, you know, drum fills? Or are they thinking about, you know, having some shockingly unique sound that doesn't sound like what they've heard before? Um, et cetera. Just learning to think of things from the other person's point of view. I think how to win friends and influence people, that book, um, it's my top recommendation. Well, cool. And I think that's one of the reasons that we connected early, early on when we just had those, conver- those phone conversations mm-hmm. back in the 90s is because we had a similar mindset about not only the DIY thing, but about how to approach this. Yeah, whether you're talking about marketing, yeah. publicity, uh, dealing with fans, it's all about everybody wants to talk about themselves, you know, and here's yeah. my album or my book <laughs> and my paintings and, the, you know, it's my paintings on the wall behind me, but it's really about yeah. how it inf- what's in it for them. And, and that making that switch, is, it's amazing how difficult that is for a lot of people. But if you can yeah. make it, it makes all the difference, all right? Yeah, exactly. So cool, cool. Uh, and then, uh, oh, so this is kind of like a, a really kind of a deep philosophical question. But, you know, we all have, I mean, there was, a, am sure, some motivation. What's like, okay, what's the real reason that you do what you do, Derek? What's your, like, and especially, I guess it's maybe evolved over the years. Cause, um, but what motivates you to do all these things that you've done? over the years is it for fame is it to make it you know make a difference is it for money is it you know uh, is it, there's so many possibilities but for you what's the underlying what's your big why before i answer that sure i have to say something that's not just me but for everyone is that i think we all have different reasons why we do things right um i was recently driving around New York City, or like the greater New York City area, and there are all these buildings that say Trump on them. The Trump Tower, the Trump Plaza, the Trump this, the Trump that. And then I even, uh, my wife and I were driving upstate New York, and we were like an hour outside of New York City, off into the, the rural green upstate New York. And then you see the somewhere like the Trump something park. And I'm like, God, he puts his name on everything, even out here where there aren't a bunch of, you know, Manhattanites to look at it. Um, I was like, what's his deal? Why does he want to put his name on everything? And then I realized that we all have different reasons why we're doing what we're doing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, for him, apparently, for Donald Trump, seems to really uh, want to leave this legacy of putting his name on things. That matters to him because he could actually make more money if he let other people put their name on things, right? If he was the owner but it got to be called the the Panasonic building or whatever, he could make more money that way. But he actually chooses to make less money, but have his name on it. That's interesting. And it, and it makes me think about um, being in the music business, or let's say even kind of being in, in Hollywood, where you see that the, the most, the richest people in Hollywood are the ones that you've never heard of. They're the movie producers that live in that mansion on the hill. But the movie stars are often not the the richest 
They're the ones that take the red carpet and the flashing lights and the glamour and all that. But they make less money because they want the glamour. You could actually make more money if you didn't want the fame. But no, what they, they want is the fame. So they choose fame. Uh, the guy in the hill who you've never heard of chooses the money but no fame. Um, Donald Trump chooses to put his name on things. Some people choose, you know, giving is what they love to do most. So the real point is, no matter what drives you, someone's going to tell you that you're wrong. <laughs> They're going to tell you you shouldn't be like that. You know, you shouldn't pursue fame, man. You could make more money this way. And then say if you're somebody who's pursuing money, somebody's going to tell you, oh, you're all about the money, man. It's not. It's got to be about the art. The point is to just be honest about whatever drives you. And you just got to notice this about yourself, right? Like what interests you the most and to just go for it and admit it. And if, and if you're interested in fame and you want to be famous, then that's awesome. It's a, it's a totally worthy pursuit. And so is, you know, being rich or so is giving or whatever. It's all of these things, you know, don't worry that somebody's going to tell you you're wrong, no matter what is your main drive and just know that in advance. So mine is I'm driven by experimentation. Well, two, two things. And it's safe to have two things because sometimes it's really is the equal. You can't choose one or the other. It's the combination mm -hmm. that that project wise, I'm driven by experimentation. That almost everything I've ever done starts with the sentence like, let's see what happens if dot, dot, dot. And I just want to experiment. I want to try things. Um, but then I'm also lifestyle wise, I'm totally driven by freedom, meaning like I will choose to have less money less fame if it means I get more freedom to go bop around the world and live in Singapore and New Zealand, you know? So mm -hmm. that's mine. That's cool. That's cool. Wow. That's uh, just some refreshing answers I don't get from every guest. And then uh, <laughs> what, uh, and usually I ask like, what's the next in the horizon? I assume, is it, is it wood egg or you have something beyond that even, or is that the main thing you're kind of focusing on now? No, wood egg was one project. I think my my main future plan, like the big goal I'm shooting for is I really like the idea of having like a dozen little businesses where I, I can be the owner, kind of more like the chairman, founder kind of guy that made it. Um, and then they can be my little experimental sandbox businesses that I can play with. But then I still get the freedom to go bop around the world as I do. Um, that, that's my big goal is to have like a bunch of little businesses yeah. that are useful to people. Are you a fan of Richard Branson? It sounds like he kind of does yeah. do that a, a bit. Yeah, that's, that's what yeah, reminded me of. I wouldn't want to be a billionaire like that. I really don't like I. Right. That's he's a funny example. I'm a real I'm a fan of Richard Branson, but I read his autobiography and I think it's interesting that he'll have, you know, a billion dollars and feel that it's not enough. He wants more. Oh, so wow. I can't I can't relate to that. You, you can know, relate but, to, his, to his starting a bunch of little things and and yeah. he, he seems to have like a sense of experimentation in play too exactly uh, then real quickly uh before i let you go here what uh, where can people find uh, uh, about you and what you're up to online oh yes yeah, sivers.org um my last name s-i-v-e-r-s dot o-r-g is my website and yeah i put everything there I, I don't really do the um i'm on facebook and all that but i don't really use it as much um so anybody who made it this far through the interview. Yeah. If, uh, Congratulations. Feel, Thank you. Feel free to email me. Honestly, I put my email address in big letters at the bottom of my website. So feel free to just send me an email and ask me anything. I'll always give you the honest answer or just say hi. That's awesome. Derek, this has been a thrill. Thank you so much uh, for Thanks, taking Bob. time for halfway around the world. You're actually in, in my future. We're recording this on a Monday in St. Louis and you're in, already in Tuesday in New Zealand. Yeah. Uh, so it's great to reconnect with you, my friend. Uh, I hope we yeah. continue to do this for many years to come. Uh, so I wish you success and thanks, uh, Bob. and thanks a lot for sharing your wisdom. Thank you for watching, whether you're watching on YouTube or on I or listening on iTunes or wherever. Um, you know, this has been an awesome one and continue to do so. And I'll be back real soon with another interview in the series. So long for now. Bye. <laughs>